All right. Welcome, everyone, um, to week two of uh, our webinars. Um, yeah, glad to have you here and hope you're doing well today. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty average day for me. Um, this is Willie, um, and we've also got Steve uh, here. Um, we're going to be uh, splitting, splitting the class today, um, uh, going through st the seven stages of cultivation. I'll start with that, and then Steve will jump into um, pros and cons of the three methods of the SARE grant that we are working on, and really hoping that um, some, some folks, most of you I see, um, are in the um, uh, range, in the, the geographical range that you can apply for this grant. So hopefully some of you will decide to do that and we'll kind of get into more of the methods of technique, the techniques and the drawbacks and benefits to those different techniques. Um, and then we'll end with some farm tours just showing, you know, what the, um, yeah, what the, what some different options can look like. Um, so that's the that's the um, plan for tonight. Steve, you got anything you want to add before we get rocking and rolling? Hey, Willie. Uh, no, I think we're good to go. Just a reminder that um, the two guidebooks we shared last week, I'll, I'll put the links in the chat at some point, um, are good reference for these topics, cover some of these things, so they're good follow-up from tonight. But looking forward to it. Sweet. Um, okay, so we'll dive in, um, starting with the seven stages of cultivation. Uh, some of you, if you have, uh, if you came to one of the live um, uh, classes, you would have seen uh, this kind of breakdown of the, the uh, stages of cultivation. And I adapted this from Trad Cotter's book, um, uh, organic mushroom farming and microremediation. Um, so that's a great book and I definitely recommend it. And um, um, yeah, you can, um, you can check that out. Um, there's a couple of things that I, I kind of changed um, in, in this version. And basically the seven stages as I see it is uh, strain selection, um, substrate, treatment. There we go. Um, yeah. So seven stages I see it. We've got strain selection and we'll kind of slowly walk through these one by one. Um, strain selection, substrate treatment, inoculation, incubation, initiation, fruiting, and harvest. So um, that's that's your seven and um, you know, there's plenty of ways to kind of like break it out and only do parts and um, you're, not, you're not always involved in all of those stages of cultivation, but if you're doing it from start to end, that's kind of what you're looking at. Um, so we'll start at look, looking like going through strain selection. Um, strain is, for, for mushrooms, strain is like similar to um, what you, what you get with like, um, with humans, right? So with humans, we're all the same species, homo sapiens. There's someone that like calls us like variety, what is it, variety modern, modern or something. Yeah, but we're all homo sapiens, but we all like look different and we all have different strength and um, can do different things with our bodies and have different colors of, of skin and eyes and hair and um, size and all those things. So those things are influenced by um, our genetic makeup, like what what genes are being expressed uh, through this species, Homo sapiens. And similar thing with mushrooms. Uh, so you take something like oyster mushrooms, Pleurotus ostriatus, and you have a ton of different varieties, a ton of different um, expressions of the potential genetic makeup. And so that will influence things like uh, yield and temperatures they fruit at 
and substrates they grow on and uh, firmness of the mushrooms and size and um, maybe even coloration of the mushroom. Um, so a lot of those things are, are dependent on strains. And there's um, businesses that have focused on, businesses and some universities that have focused, it, focused on uh, developing strains and really um, finding the highest performing strains. So typically the strains that you find, say in the grocery store, are gonna be faster growing, higher yielding uh, sh strains than say something that you just find out in the wild. Um, so a lot of times if you just clone an oyster, say from a sugar maple that's growing down the street, um, it'll, it'll probably fruit, but it won't fruit as abundantly as something that's been uh, bred. Um, so a couple of common strains uh, for oysters are 1, 2, 3, and 3015. And we did a, a strain trial with shiitakes um, that was looking at... Um, uh, these different strains on different substrates. Um, and feel free to ask questions throughout this. You can just type questions into the chat box and um, I'll, I'll get to them as I, as I can. Um, and so what we did is we looked at five different strains on two different substrates. So in these, uh, in the graph, in the boxes, the uh, vertical boxes, you can see the strain numbers or the abbreviations. So um, you have you know, 46 or 3782 or 75, and those are just names of the strain. Like my name's Willie and Steve's name's Steve. You know, it's just the, we just tend not to name humans um, numbers. Um, but for some reason we do that with, with mushrooms. Um, and the first time we tried them on logs, and this is uh, over the course of two years. And you can see that the average, uh, uh, yield per log was over two pounds for, for, for WR46, um, which is double uh, the next closest strain, which was 3782. So just by selecting the right strain, you're more than doubling, you're, you're basically doubling your yield, right? So if you have, if you're growing 50 pounds of mushrooms, all of a sudden, if you're growing the right strain, you're growing 100 pounds of mushrooms. Um, and then again, we look at that. We looked at that with supplemented sawdust, so a different uh, substrate, but the same um, the same sh strains. And interestingly enough, um, LE forty six, which was the best for logs, did the worst for supplemented sawdust. And three seven eight two, which was the second best for logs, but way behind forty six. Uh, did the best um, on, on the uh, supplemented sawdust. And again, almost 50% better than uh, the next closest, 3790. So again, uh, the proper strain selection um, has a really big impact. Um, and some universities that I, it's primarily UPenn, University of Pennsylvania, that, or, or Penn State, I don't know which one, that works on um, works with mushrooms. Um, and I guess, I didn't know this, but I guess Cornell has worked on strains as well. Um, but it's interesting because I was just learning that in China, there's over 18 institutions dedicated, um, dedicated to mushrooms and like mushroom development and looking at, um, yeah, looking at, um, different new species and different methods of cultivation. Um, so no, nowhere near that in terms of like public institutions that are doing that uh, here in the US. Um, really, if you want good strains, you should just go over to China and get, get good strains from there. Um, okay, so our second um, stage of cultivation is substrate treatment. So uh, basically uh, the material that we're growing mushrooms on needs to be treated in some way for it to be suitable for the mycelium to take hold, right? We talked about the life cycle and, and what we're doing uh, after substrate treatment is introducing the mycelium of the mushroom we want to grow um, into, uh, into the substrate. And if you just take the substrate and, you know, add the mycelium right away, um, other, other microorganisms are going to grow. So 
this all depends, the, the method of treatment all depends on how much nutrients are available in the substrate. So if you have a lot of, um, if you have a lot of uh, nutrients in a substrate, then you're gonna have to do a more aggressive treatment method. If the nutrients are pretty locked up, like in logs, um, this middle picture here, um, you don't really have to do anything, right? So just giving the mycelium a head start in the logs and cutting the logs fresh is enough to kind of uh, give, give the mycelium an edge and get established before any other fungal competitors um, take over. But logs take a long time to, um, to uh, incubate, right? They take, you know, usually six months to a year, um, depending on the size to be ready to fruit. Um, whereas with, with higher um, nutrient strain substrates like straw or uh, sawdust, um, the mycelium can take over in 10 days, 14 days, um, but you do have to treat it a little more aggressively. With straw, Steve will talk about that later. Um, it can be heat, lime, fermentation, and um, with supplemented sawdust, that's pretty much always steam. Um, okay, and moving on, um, just, just a follow up here, a strain, um, what is, what is a strain? You can just go back and look at the, uh, the webinar, but it's essentially, um, a variety, uh, of a species. Um, okay. So our next step is inoculation. And this is just the introduction of mycelium into the substrate. So we've got clean substrate, it's ready to grow mushrooms, and we're introducing the mycelium of the mushroom we want to grow um, into the substrate. So uh, one key thing here is, is the difference between clean and sterile. So clean, you know, with, with wood, wood chips, straw, all these things, you don't need a sterile environment. You can just do them outside, you can just do them in an ambient environment, you don't need a lab or to be super clean or anything. It's, it's nice to be, it's nice to like wash your hands with, with soap and um, have a fairly clean table, uh, but it's, it's not imperative to be sterile. Uh, sterile is really uh, applicable when you start using steam. And basically you're using uh, such a high nutrient material that things can very easily, that are just in the air, can very easily start growing on that. And with steam, you're really wiping the, the plate clean. You know, it's like nothing is, is really alive in there. So it's, it's easy for things to get established quickly. Whereas with a straw or wood, there's still a lot of defenses up and it's not, not as easy for uh, microorganisms to, to get in. Um, and we talked some about, about what spawn is, you know, spawn, uh, just, just know that the only similarity between spawn and spore is they both start with SP and that's it. Spores are a completely different life cycle, life stage uh, than spawn. Spawn is mycelium. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a really common mistake that I see. And if you wanna, um, if you wanna like betray yourself as a total noob, then ask about spores. But um, if you wanna be like, I know what I'm doing, then use, use spawn and mycelium interchangeably. Um, all right, so after we've introduced the mycelium, uh, we're going into incubation. And um, this is just the, the point where uh, you sit back, relax, and let the mycelium grow out. So this is part of how I got super excited about uh, mushroom cultivation. It was like, oh, you can um, inoculate logs and then like do nothing for a whole year. And they just do their thing. Um, that's awesome. I would love to do that. So uh, incubation is a nice time where you just let the mycelium grow and, and it's, it's all good. Um, if, you, if you are doing a large amount of incubation, uh, it generates a lot of heat. So um, you're going you're gonna to need some sort of cooling. Um, and if you just have a good insulated building, you tend to not need uh, heating. Even in the winter, the mycelium generates enough heat that um, it, it can kind of hold its own. Um, 
and a big consideration in incubation of a, a thing with a lot of mushroom farms is how long are we going to let our substrates sit in the incubation and uh, shiitake being this the the most cultivated specialty mushroom is actually the biggest like time hog to cultivate um, so shiitakes usually are in incubation for six to ten weeks whereas pretty much all the other specialty mushrooms um, except maitake except maitake maybe rishi they're all growing so oysters and chestnuts and mako and piopino and lion's mane they're all growing in about um, 14 days in incubation so it's a very very quick turnover for those um, so what some some people do is let the in terms of like structuring buying blocks in and making your own um, some people will buy shiitake blocks in because they're such a space hog and then gr and then grow their own oysters or lion's mane grow those blocks themselves um, and once incubation is complete it can the the bags can be directly moved into the fruiting room or they can be placed in cold storage until you're ready to fruit them so you could build up a kind of surplus of these blocks and then um, uh, put them in a walk-in cooler and kind of leave them there for three or four weeks until you need them in the, in the fruiting room. Um, after about four weeks, they will just start fruiting on their own. So it's good to uh, just month max in cold storage. Um, and after incubation is initiation. And this is basically shifting from uh, the mycelium growing out and colonizing the substrate to uh, mushroom production. And look at that. That is so, so beautiful. Um, so that's a gorgeous flush of blue oysters that's coming out. That, um, that center cluster will probably be like a one, one and a half pound cluster by itself. So those mushrooms over the next four days will become massive. Um, and the way that uh, you kind of start, um, you, you, the way that initiation works is primarily through airflow. So you can see here in this bag, a um, small X or T was cut into the bag and the mushroom, which breathes oxygen, um, will grow out of that hole, right? So the mycelium is all connected and it'll actually send all the all of its energy and nutrients to that one spot where it's where it's getting oxygen. Um, so when you're shifting from incubation to initiation, typically it's good to drop the temperature slightly. Um, if you can, it's okay if you can't. Um, increase humidity and increase airflow. So, um, and, and with shiitakes, one, you know, they like a um, cold shock before they're, they're moved in. So part of their initiation strategy is to just put them in a walk-in cooler overnight. And that really, I think it kind of stimulates, you know, fall or, or something, something about that species in particular that really, really appreciates uh, a cold shock to get fruiting. Um, and I haven't really seen a particular role of light in, in, in um, either incubation or initiation. So incubation can, can occur in total darkness. The mycelium doesn't need light in order to grow. Initiation, um, it's good to have some light um, because the, the mushrooms are uh, phototropic. So they, they will um, orient to light. And oysters will get really long stems and little caps if there isn't sufficient light. Um, so when you're, when you're moving into uh, initiation and fruiting, you're going to want to have, um, you know, lighting that is comfortable to read in, uh, uh, in, the, in there. Yeah, so after initiation, we have our fruiting body development. Um, and that's, you know, that can occur in a fruiting room like this or in outdoors or in, in plenty of different structures. But here's kind of your, your four primary parameters and spectrums uh, to, to keep them around. Um, so of course there's variability in here and depending on how many pounds of mushrooms you're growing and your setup and how serious you are, um, you might have 
larger or narrower um, um, parameters. So humidity looking at anywhere from 75 to 90 percent and particularly in the initiation phase, the first four days of fruiting, um, you want humidity closer to that 90 percent. So just as they're pinning. And when they get to the stage that we saw in the last slide, uh, they start to be a little bit more resilient to lower humidities. So humidity can drop down to 80, 80 percent, 75 percent, and it won't it won't have a huge impact. Um, CO2 below 800 parts per million, particularly for oysters. What I've found is that shiitakes and lion's mane do just fine uh, up to about 1,000, 1,100 parts per million. So they are more tolerant of high CO2. Um, a temperature range, you know, ideal between 55 and 75. The sweet spot is, you know, 62, 63. Um, that's where you kind of get the highest quality mushrooms and the, the fastest growth. Um, low, low temperature mushrooms tend to be meatier and a really high quality. They just grow slowly. Um, and then lighting, uh, 16 hours on, eight hours off is usually what I do. Um, I know people that do 24 hours on. Um, there's some people that do 12, 12 on, 12 off. I found that to be a little bit um, short that the, the mushrooms got a little bit stemmy at that. So I would stay in the you know, 14 hours or 16 hours on uh, range for, for lighting. And there isn't really a particular spectrum um, that you need to, to include um, in, in lighting. Um, so this is one example of what a fruit, fruiting room can look like. You have the metal PVC pipe um, shelving and uh, LED lights running at the top of each, um, uh, each shelf. And these are 10 pound blocks. Um, this is pictured here as Brad uh, from um, Wildwood Mushrooms, which is a farm in Sutton. And unfortunately, they, he had a fire in, in, his, in his farm um, and is just now getting back to, to rebuilding. Um, and yeah, and I'm going to go through a couple other examples of what a fruiting room uh, could look like. Um, yeah, so um, your, your estimate for, for putting together a fruiting room, if you want an indoor fruiting room, and the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest advantage to an indoor fruiting room is that you can grow year round. So, you, you know, you, you don't have to stop or whatever. Um, this is kind of your uh, baseline budget. And the biggest thing is you're not controlling temperature here. So if you did it, say, in a basement, uh, you wouldn't really need much temperature control. If you were doing it in something more like a warehouse or something, you might need... Um, uh, temperature control, which is is then, you know, additional, definitely additional money here. Um, but pretty basic uh, list of materials uh, adding up to around $700 to be growing 100 pounds of mushrooms a week. Um, and, and there's a lot of variability in that. But that's essentially what we did in this room. And uh, this was in the basement of a residential house. Um, and we basically had all those things listed there. We didn't have heating or cooling and we exhausted out of the back of the room. So the air intake was just passive at the front of the room and then it um, exhausted out a window in the back of the room. Um, and we were able to grow around 150 pounds in here um, and um, there's no drains in the floor. Every couple of days, we'd vacuum water up uh, from these, from this, uh, uh, from this floor. Um, and this is just contractor plastic and two by fours that we ripped in half, and very, very basic uh, uh, setup. Um, and our production numbers in in that room. So it's a 16 by 8 room, and we were moving about 96 bags in per week. So uh, we were leaving those in for four weeks, which, you know, the first 
10 days, we got about a pound per black per bag. And I think that's a really good metric to estimate with of being like, okay, I'm going to um, expect that I get one pound um, per bag that I for a five pound bag that I move in. Um, and then two weeks later, we get about a half a pound off of those same bags. So um, starting with 96 pounds, and then as we get in the swing of things, that additional 48 pounds coming in. So each week we are producing, you know, 140. It would vary from, you know, 120, 130 up to 150. Um, with with yields, there's just there's just variability. You know, sometimes the mushrooms are doing better, sometimes they're not doing as well, and it's kind of this constant dance of um, modifying um, the atmospheric um, conditions so that the mushrooms are are fruiting well. Um, and at, you can see here that at an eight to twelve dollar per pound um, value or sale price, that's anywhere from eleven $1 hundred to seventeen hundred dollars per week. Um, if you're assuming those blocks, if you're buying blocks in, you're assuming they're six dollars a pound. Um, those are going to cost about five hundred seventy-six dollars. So then you have you know anywhere from five hundred to twelve hundred dollars to cover your other costs. So um, at eight dollars a pound, you know it's kind of hard to make this quantity and and purchasing blocks in um, be very profitable. But at twelve dollars a pound, uh, it's it's very doable. And and this is kind of the, like most basic fruiting room. So if if what you're looking for is not to be inside and um, in like this clean room and you're actually just wanting to be in the woods and barefoot and, and, sh and just hanging out, um, this would be kind of your, your best option. Uh, so these are low tunnels that we put together. Um, it's really simple, like strips of greenhouse plastic and um, they're about three, two and a half, three foot high. Um, two and a half, three foot high uh, uh, hoop houses. So we were just using these all the way from April until uh, uh, November um, and fruiting mushrooms in those. So that's, that's a pretty, um, that's a very, very uh, low initial cost uh, way to, to cultivate. Um, for this method, I wouldn't recommend doing blue oysters uh, because they get really buggy but shiitake do phenomenal um, like this. And we would just come down every day and spray spray down the, um, the blocks, take the tarp off, spray it down. If it was gonna rain, we'd take the tarp off. And um, if, it was, if there was a ton of mushrooms and it was gonna rain, we'd put, keep the tarp on. Um, so the plastic just gives a little bit of uh, protection um, and moisture retention for the blocks. Um, but definitely a viable method. and. Um, very low investment cost. Um, and the, the weight on the blocks of all of these are um, five pounds. So they're five, five to six pound blocks. Um, yeah, other species you can do outdoors. Uh, yellow oysters do well. Lion's mane does well. Uh, chestnuts and pio, chestnuts and namaco do well in the colder months. Um, Pio Pino does pretty well. Um, yeah, those are all those are all viable ones for uh, outdoor like this. So those are some options in the fruity room, um, and you'll see some more uh, later later tonight. Um, and our last method, our last uh, stage of cultivation is harvest. Right. So now we've got all these big beautiful mushrooms. They're ready to go. And we're we're picking um, we're picking um, picking the mushrooms off, and it's a really basic thing. A lot of them you can just twist and pull. Shiitakes, you can use scissors or knife. Um, it's good to not have a ton of substrate that you're getting, and and also good to consider what you're harvesting into. Um, mushrooms are fragile. And if you can some if you can harvest into their sale bin, you know whether that's cardboard boxes or pints, um, it's really helpful to limit um, 
to limit handling. Um, if you're not going to do that, we use these bulb crates um, to harvest into and then just store them bulk in that and then pack them into uh, uh, you know, five pound boxes or um, three pound boxes. So, um, and once they're harvested, as soon as possible, you want to get them in the in in the walk-in cooler uh, or fridge. So, ideally, storing the mushrooms um, at about thirty-six degrees, anywhere from thirty-four to thirty-eight, uh, is great. And we would put a towel over these these bins, so these wouldn't be these wouldn't be um, just like open, uh, we put a towel over to, to keep them from, from drying out. And I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Um, after I answer this question from Rob, which is, do you have the production numbers and sizes on the low tunnels? Um, I don't have those like the way I have for the grow room. Um, yeah, I don't. It's a, it's a similar um, yield, you know, so you're going to be getting about a pound from first flush blocks. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. It was, I can, I can, um, I can get back to you on that one. Okay. Over to you, Steve. Cool. Thanks. So we're going to uh, look a little deeper into some of the methods that we're uh, focused on in this project. Um, these are not necessarily all the methods that one could do to cultivate mushrooms, um, but we're going to focus on these as specifically some of the ways that we can scale up production and get into commercial um, sales pretty readily. And I think Willie and I could both agree that uh, a common assumption that uh, new growers have is that they need to take on all three of these stages um, in the sort of production cycle. And what we want to encourage you to think about is which of these stages might make sense for you to take on and others that might make sense to source out. In the same way that a vegetable farm might, um, you know, buy in seed or um, sometimes even buy in starts or buy in compost. These are elements of the production system that might be more cost effective if outsourced. So We'll look at these three methods that we're focused on in this project and kind of dig into that um, with that in mind. And what I want to do is with each of these methods kind of think about this entire process if we were to start from a raw culture, meaning essentially a, a little cutting of a mushroom um, that we could grow out. So most strains are clones. Um, most often are propagated from a fruiting body where they're taken into a, st a clean sterile space opened up, a little cuttings taken from the inside of the mushroom that's grown out on a petri, a petri dish. And, uh, you know, um, a lot of spawn companies um, maintain what we might call a culture library where we're, you know, maintaining these strains in kind of that young form and then transferring those to master uh, slides or plates that are the first initial growth uh, of, of the mushrooms. And so in that process is one level of treating material and making sure it's clean and, and very sterile. So as we go down this list, the sterility is a little bit less potentially, uh, but not always. Spawn production would be taking those masters, growing them out, usually on grain. That grain is sterilized and you can divide those out in multiple rounds. That's another um, process where we treat the substrate, usually with sterile uh, pressure treatment. So we pressurize and clean that material, often grain again. And in some cases we're transferring grain to grain or we might be transferring grain to sawdust. That spawn is then uh, used to inoculate the substrates. And the difference here is now we're intending to inoculate something that's gonna fruit mushrooms. So we're really just growing this out and expanding it. And so in this stage, we might add a mixture of carbon and nitrogen, um, it, whether it's something like a log or straw, which is pretty low in the nutrient um, load, but high, uh, um, there's high carbon in it. There's food for the mushrooms in it, but it's not the same as a supplemented sawdust block where we might do a mix of sawdust with other uh, grain byproducts. And then we bring it through those stages that Willie just talked about. And you can see on the right of this slide, we start to get into the infrastructure needed for each of these stages. So it's a lot necessary you know, to go from nothing to having a lab, having an inoculation space that's clean, an incubation chamber and a fruiting room. So depending on what you want to get into, what skills you have, and what's cost effective at the scale you want to produce, 
um, all these decisions can be um, somewhat flexible. So if we uh, look at oysters on straw, one of the advantages is that we take out those first pieces. We're going to buy in, spawn from a supplier, again, who's done that kind of heavy, sterile work. And we're going to take that um, spawn, whether it's, again, grain or sawdust or some mixture, and we're going to on-farm treat our substrate, inoculate that. Um, and the inoculation space in this case is pretty low tech. It could even be outdoors in open air. Uh, because of the fact that straw is low nutritive, it doesn't have a lot of um, threats from competitive molds or other fungi. So as Willie mentioned, we can treat it in a variety of ways. Um, we can use lime to raise the pH, kind of knock out the competition in that way. And the oysters are tolerant of that, <clears throat> that increased pH. We can do heat pasteurization. Um, those two would be the most common ways. Heat pasteurization would really just be cooking the straw um, at usually 140 to 160 degrees for one to two hours would clean it sufficiently. So you can imagine doing that even on your kitchen you know, stove up into something like a 55 gallon drum in a farm setting. For this process, you do you need a space to um, incubate and, and a space to do the fruiting as well if we get into this. So um, what I like about straw, what we've found beneficial on our farm is those lower infrastructure needs, um, less sterile treatment, a little less worry of contamination. But we, what we do see with those less nutritive substrates generally is lower yields. We want to assume that our yields per flush are going to be maybe half of what we would expect from a supplemented sawdust block. And so there's a cost benefit to that in terms of what we're putting in and what we're getting out. In the basic process, we take our straw, whether we're sourcing that from a local provider, we could buy in straw. Um, sometimes um, that can be more economical depending where you live. Um, <clears throat> sometimes that straw, if you're buying it in, is already pre-shredded. We do want to shred it before we treat it and shredding it breaks down some of those waxy lignans that are in the straw uh, and, and allows for the, the material to be packed better into our containers, allows that mycelium then to grow through it at a much more rapid pace. Treatment wise, most common, this is kind of the low tech farm style where we have a basket or, you know, we used to use um, pillowcases at our farm and we'd stuff the straw in there like tea bags and then we put it in our water that we were heating to heat pasteurize it. Once it's done, we're pulling it out, we're spreading it out. If it's, if it's heat treated, we need to cool it down before we introduce that um, spawn into the material so we don't fry it. And then we pack it back into containers for incubation and for fruiting. So as far as treatments go, um, in addition to what I mentioned before, there are a couple other options. Uh, you can actually ferment uh, the, the straw itself, um, which is, we like to call the stinky straw method because it, it ends up with a very stinky process. This is where we're starving the straw of oxygen, which kills a lot of the competitive microbial activity. So it sits in the water and that can be for a few days up to over a week, depending on the temperature outside. So this would be our lowest tech. We're just putting it in water, draining it and inoculating it. But most often this is good for areas that don't have access to the other materials, but um, long term, unless you really like the smell of stinky anaerobic straw, it's usually not what we see commercial growers doing. Um, lime, it's important to note with lime, and you could use, um, most common is hydra hydrated mason's lime with a content of less than 10% magnesium. So depending on where you are and where local suppliers are sourcing their lime, um, that can be easy or can be difficult to find, but that's an important factor to get the desired effect. You can also use wood ash um, at a very high amount. And again, a lot of commercial growers don't tend to go with wood ash. They'll focus on the lime because they can use a very small amount to get the desired effect, which is to raise the pH of our water, generally um, at least to 10. Um, hydrogen peroxide is um, um, a method that's been put out there. There's a whole uh, guidebook series online about using hydrogen peroxide. I don't have a lot of experience with that, but it is an option out there. Probably most common is heat pasteurization, which I mentioned is generally 140 up to 175, 180 degree water for two hours to treat that straw. So lots of options here, you know, very low tech outside. We don't have to have a lot of infrastructure. Um, this is from a book that Willie uh, put together. You can find it on the Fungi Ally website, all about cultivating oysters on straw. 
Um, Willie compared different methods and the yields for different strains of oyster uh, mushrooms um, and found some interesting results um, around that. Um, and, and so you can just see the simple setup here, which is the, the steel drum with a turkey fryer, propane tank, and some cinder blocks is really all you need um, to get this, uh, this piece started here. Um, on our farm, we, we did this for several years and we're going to continue to do it. Um, we've, we've grown in a variety of things. We can pack that straw into these like long <laughs> straw logs um, uh, that are kind of fun. Um, the black plastic is great to keep light out, which can, can uh, discourage growth of competitive molds. Uh, and we usually always did a, a couple what we call truth bags. So those clear bags so we can actually see what's going on with the mycelium inside. And of course, straw cultivation for oysters and chestnut is a great um, material to use in buckets. The biggest challenge there being that buckets are really hard to clean. So a lot of extra labor in the, um, after the mushrooms are fruited and cleaning out all that material and getting it clean enough so you don't have a contamination cycle start to break out in your containers. So it's important to focus, make sure that that's um, uh, part of your plan if you're gonna use those reasons. So oysters on straw to kind of summarize pros, um, pretty significantly low initial investment in infrastructure. We can do most of our inoculation or treatment outdoors. So we don't need that space inside. Um, we're, we're lower on the contamination risk um, factor. And then we can also use kind of reusable containers if we're willing to put in that extra time and effort. Um, some of the cons, we get lower yields than when we deal with supplemented sawdust blocks. We do have to shred that straw before use, which is an added you know, cost potentially. Um, you do need an incubation space for this. And there's a, there's a critical time crunch between when you pull that material out of your treatment into inoculation. Since you're outdoors, <clears throat> the potential for contamination in that interim is high. And so you need to really be paying attention and very efficient at inoculating and then packing your um, material. There you go. All right, back to our like big picture. Here's all the pieces if we were to cultivate from the beginning. Um, <clears throat> we're going to focus on next uh, our in-house block production. So we kind of cut out again those top pieces. I would I would say that most commercial growers are not doing the master cultures and the and the spawn production. They're usually starting at this phase. Again, we're going to treat the substrate. The biggest difference here is we need to do a, a higher tech or more intensive treatment. Um, so generally speaking, we do one of two things. We use a pressure uh, pressure sterilization, whether that's in small um, pressure canners or we can outfit a, a container to do that if we know how to do it so it's safe so it doesn't explode <laughs> or an autoclave would be a common tool for a lot of larger scale operations. Um, atmospheric steam is basically um, so so I should say under pressure sterilization you can achieve good uh, sterile conditions at about 15 psi for just a few hours. Sometimes people go as low as an hour. Um, atmospheric steam would be just pumping lots of hot steam into the container. Usually that's for at least 16 hours, if not more, to get that cleaning effect. But that can work and that's a much more sort of accessible way and arguably a safer way if you don't have the technology to deal with um, doing this under pressure. So that's a little bit different than the straw, a little bit kind of a step up. Um, <clears throat> and then we have our inoculation space, which is usually done indoors, usually in a clean space that has, um, you know, a, a uh, clean air being blown at you in the space that you're working so that you're not introducing contaminants because now you're usually working with some mixture of sawdust and a supplement and so contamination risks tend to go up. And our incubation and fruiting chambers can look very similar to that with straw but potentially we're going to step that up a bit further um, to really maximize those those yields. So uh, you know, we have all these different kind of pieces to the puzzle here with our uh, spawn, with our fruiting blocks and, and everything like that. There's a process here where we take our raw materials. We need to have some process to mix it. Um, I know this is a picture from Willie when they were just doing it by hand, which took a lot of labor and time to get the right mix of things. Um, folks have used automatic bagging, uh, mixer baggers to get this uh, mix right. Part of the mixture uh, mixing process is also getting the moisture content right. So it's really important before we clean our materials, and it's the same for straw, but with a lot of the straw techniques, we're soaking them in water, and so we're hydrating that material. But dry sawdust takes a bit of water in order to get the right moisture content. You're not going to get that from 
the pressure sterilization or from the atmospheric steam, you really need to have that as part of your mixing process. And we do our kind of same pieces and treatment inoculation, that sort of thing. So here's an autoclave. This is a smug town mushrooms in Rochester, uh, moving their autoclave into a new space. Pretty large uh, system here. A lot of autoclaves are pretty um, sizable. This is on the larger end, but it takes some infrastructure um, and some investment. And of course, if you want to move camp, um, it can take a lot of, um, a lot of fun logistics in order to make that happen. Um, for steam, atmospheric steam, there's sort of a lot more options, I think, for the beginning grower. <clears throat> um, uh, there's a <clears throat> product called Bubba's Barrels. Um, Mike, or excuse me, Eric Myers of Myers Mushrooms. If you look up MyersMushrooms.com, he has a lot of videos showing you how to build your own 55 gallon drum version for a steamer. Uh, and then also he partnered with this company called Bubba's Barrels who now pre um, uh, makes those those barrels with a with a um, float valve and um, and a heating element to create that steam and you can steam your materials overnight and those barrels can do somewhere between 200 to 500 pounds of dry substrate so uh, imagine dividing that by <clears throat> by five and you get at roughly how many bags you could do depending on the size of the container so you can build it yourself or you can actually pre um, pre-order those um, Willie I know for years used and we're looking into using a sauna steamer uh, connecting that up to a stock tank or some other kind of tank we have an old stainless steel tank that we're looking to um, use steam for both straw and our, our sawdust. And so you can get a sauna steamer, sometimes used for cheaper, but a new one might be around $1,000, plus the setup to get it all going. And you can just pump steam into that container with your bags or with your straw. And then on a smaller scale, um, and I do know some commercial growers that are doing this, but it's a little more labor intensive. You can use these all American pressure cookers. Definitely recommended to use the ones that use uh, our electric so that you can set the timer um, unless you want to get up in the middle of the night because a 16 hour site or a, a few hour cycle can be hard to, to maintain depending on your other things. This is a full kind of pressure sterilized situation. Those little uh, containers are often, um, those little pressure containers are about a thousand dollars a piece and they can do about 30 pounds of substrate. So it works on a much smaller scale for things. When we're inoculating, generally speaking, we're going to put it on into a space that we can blow uh, clean, sterile air into our workspace so that we're not introducing contaminants. What we're gonna do is remove those bags from our, um, whatever we use to treat them, open them up, get that spawn in there and seal them up as quickly as possible. And it's best done in a room or in a space that's devoted to that where you can clean down the space really easily, um, where you have the HEPA filter blowing this, this sterile air at you and you have a nice stainless steel table. And so there's lots of plans online for how to build these. Um, fresh Cap Mushrooms, uh, Fresh Cap and, yeah, Fresh Cap has a, a series of videos about building your own, um, but very worth it. This is actually a shipping container that was retrofitted in New York City just for this purpose. And then incubation, we've already talked about. Um, we need a space for that where we're keeping temperatures cool. And from my experience, we like to keep things a little bit darker. Um, when you have natural light or too much light, you can just encourage molds to form. So keeping things a bit darker and cooler is going to have a good effect with your bags. So pros for in-house production, you have a lot of control over um, species and strain and kind of the, the, the production process at that point. At a certain scale, it's definitely more cost effective to produce blocks in house versus potentially buying them in, which we're going to talk about next. And we can use local resources. I can source sawdust from a local sawmill, from local operations. And, and I really see this as part of a, a recycling process, as part of a soil building process. At the end of this production cycle, we have a product that is actually really valuable in and of itself that we can reintegrate back into other farm systems. So part of our potting mix and part of what we grow our trees in are composted blocks and composted sawdust post-production, right? So we have all those kind of pieces in place. The con, uh, just like with straw, we need an incubation space. So that's a sort of a doubling of the square footage of infrastructure we need. Um, oops, that says have to shred the straw, but it's really that we have to mix um, the uh, sawdust and the other materials uh, beforehand. And we do need some kind of lab or clean space in order to do that inoculation process without long-term problems. All right, and then finally, just to revisit our first, and, and the thing I wanna point here is you can see if you were to do the whole process, there's three points in there where you're treating substrate. And that's three points where you can potentially introduce contamination. And 
the effect of that contamination, the, the, the problems that can result from it are, is more significant the higher you go on this scale. So if we're doing that initial culturing, if, that's, if those get contaminated, it's a much bigger effect than if we go further down the list. But taking all of these risks in house is one of the most important things, especially as a new grower who maybe hasn't developed the refined techniques of how to avoid those problems. So last one we're gonna look at is our ready to fruit blocks. Here we are, boom, we just eliminated um, a lot of that material. We're actually not doing any um, inoculation, substrate treatment. Um, we're really just buying in this material. The biggest change here is we need, in, in most cases, to have sufficient cold storage because it's only really cost effective to buy in blocks in bulk and then store them in a cold space and then introduce them to the fruiting room. So in Willie's example, he, he put 96 blocks in um, per week in that growing space, in that fruiting room. And you might buy you know three or four times that much at a, at a given time time and and hold those and then introduce them in chunks every single week but this allows you to get started and really focus on the fruiting and the sales part and this can be a really important way to potentially get your business started and then you could you know take on more of the um, other steps in the process as you get more comfortable as your markets are developed so um, so it's an interesting uh, possibility for a lot of folks we really just have to have a fruiting room in this case as long as we can source the blocks at an economical price so uh, ready to fruit blocks, uh, what we see is uh, shiitake and oyster being most common. You can also usually source um, lion's mane, chestnuts becoming more popular, piapinos. Um, and so most of our major species are things that we can find on ready to fruit blocks. Again, the infrastructure is definitely gonna acquire some cold storage. Probably one of the more economical ways to do this is through a technology called CoolBot, which uses a basic air conditioning unit. And you buy the CoolBot um, add-on and basically it kind of tricks the air conditioning unit to, um, to work as a refrigerator. And so you can use this in a space that you build or in a trailer as shown here with um, this, this uh, this is from Fat Moon Mushrooms, which we'll talk about as it, when we get into the farm tours. Um, another factor is you often, with uh, bulk block suppliers, they're often shipping them by the pallet, or sometimes you have to go pick them up. So that could be a make or break kind of scenario. If, if um, you're driving several days to get blocks, it probably doesn't make sense, but maybe there's a supplier um, close by and that can be economical. If they're willing to ship a pallet, then you often have to have a place that's commercial um, for them to unload and, and provide those because they're on a pallet and usually it's, a, it's over 1500 pounds of, of weight. And so you're gonna need to have, have that capacity to deal with the freight companies. So that's a factor in here that could or could not make this uh, work for you. So right now there's a handful of suppliers that provide ready to fruit blocks. The only one I know of that does um, small quantities that will ship to any address is Field and Forest is starting to do this. Um, if you buy a certain amount, generally they're four to six dollars a block and they'll ship them as, in as few as eight per box. But the shipping cost per block is much more significant than when you start to look at buying in bulk. Um, and if you're wanting to do 100 blocks a week, then you're now you know, paying to ship eight or 10 boxes just to get that, uh, that quantity met. Um, so these are some of the ones <clears throat> I think we can uh, sort of put out to the group here. You know, one of the pieces of this industry is that we need more block suppliers. Um, this is gonna help elevate everyone as a whole. So if there's an area where this is deficient, you might wanna think about uh, if you're interested in that step of the process, being more of a block producer than someone who's actually doing the fruiting and sales. And that's an open option that certainly we could see uh, as a need as this industry continues to, to grow. So you can kind of check out these folks and see what their deals are and how they could work or, or not for you. So the nice thing about um, ready to fruit blocks is really low initial investment. Um, we really just need a fruiting room and that can be like Willie showed a, a fruiting tent outside. Um, it can be something in a basement or a closet or a high tunnel as I'll show uh, that we did on our farm. We're lowering our contamination risk because essentially when the blocks arrive, they're fully um, ready to, to fruit. And so there's not, a, um, there's not that waiting period. The, the most dangerous part of the cycle where we can get into contamination with most of these is that incubation stage where we're sort of outsourcing that piece. Um, cons would be we need that reliable coal storage. It's gonna be cash flow heavy. We need to have that cash to buy the blocks ahead of time. 
And if we rely on ready to fruit blocks as our sole production method, then that's, <clears throat> we sort of take that out of our enterprise budget as an option to improve in terms of efficiency. So if I produce my blocks or my sawdust bags in house, theoretically over time, I can improve upon that in terms of the cost per unit. And that can be significant, but if you're buying them in, you're sort of beholden to how the, how the company is working and what their deal is for, for that payment. All right, so let's we'll pause for a minute, see if there's any questions about those, uh, those three methods and some of the pros and cons. There's no perfect way to, to make this happen. Um, and what we're gonna do is some farm tours. So we're gonna just look at a couple different examples from our farms and, um, <clears throat> and a few other places just to give you a sense of uh, the different possibilities um, for how folks have, have worked with mushroom cultivation. So. I uh, have some nice pictures coming up, but let's see if there's any questions first. Looks like Willie's on it. That's great, man. Um, <laughs> and uh, Willie, do you have any uh, thoughts on Mark's question about p chestnuts? Because I haven't done chestnuts in straw. How were those being treated most often? Or how's that substrate being prepared? Can we use the lime? as a method or is it mostly heat or what, what's the deal with that? Yeah, the lime is, is fine to use um, for the chestnuts and the, the pH actually with, with that technique, the pH doesn't stay high for very long. So pretty quickly the pH uh, balances, you know, it's like it spikes up to 13, but once you take it out of the solution, pretty quickly it's dropping back down to eight, seven. Um, so it's, it's not a long term um yeah it's not growing in a super high ph um question <clears throat> let's see whoops hold on a lot of questions great keep yeah, them coming open up an, you open up an avalanche steve <laughs> um Yeah, Eric's asking if the rice bran is better than wheat bran. Um, those are not um, supplements I've used. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't trade, I haven't like traded them back and forth. I've, you, I've heard of um, uh, rice hulls used in place of soybean hulls um, for the masters mix, uh, particularly on the west coast where there's a lot more rice available. Um, but I haven't heard of rice bran being substituted for wheat bran for shiitakes. Um, so I don't know if that formula would work well, but worth a try. Yeah. And what I'd say is that I think in any case, um, you know, sourcing local, sourcing organic, finding the mix of materials that you can get is ideal and, and then trying things out. So for instance, on our webinar page, we have a grower who did an experiment last year mixing coffee grounds with sawdust and she um, got a SARE grant, it's a farmer grant, um, to try different mixtures. She did like a 10% coffee ground, 25, 50, 75, to see what mix of coffee grounds worked well. And, and her main motivation was recognizing that coffee grounds were a nutritive supplement that she could get locally for free, if only she can kind of figure out that recipe. And I think that's a good lesson, no matter what you might be uh, working with, to kind of take some time to figure out that mix. Um, if you're using sawdust, it's, it's important to source um, a single species or at least be able to control the mixture of hardwoods. Um, we had some questions, I had some questions in my email box about, you know, sourcing sawdust from a you know, cabinet maker and he might have a pile out back that has a little bit of maple and a little bit of oak and a little bit of cherry. And, you know, when it's that kind of unknown mixture, it can be a little harder to have uniformity. And over time, you might find that really cause a lot of ups and downs in your yields. And so my suggestion to that person was, see if you can get them to separate those things out. So at the very least you can, you can um, have a regulated mix as you go, but, but do take time to, to know that you need to kind of customize that because not all oak sawdust even is, is exactly the same depending on where you are. Um, All right, Lisa's asking how, uh, what temp to keep the blocks at if buying from a supplier. So it's basically refrigerated temperatures. Um, you know, anything into the 40s and above, you know, it's going to slow down the growth, but you're likely going to get those mushrooms starting to push out because they're usually sent to you at a, at a point when they're ready to go. Um, 
Um, sometimes you can work out with a, a block supplier to send you blocks that are a little less mature if you're, you know, cold storage is this or that, but that can be, that can be challenging. So generally fridge, fridge kind of temperatures is what we're thinking about to store those blocks. Um, Leslie's asking if the majority of commercial producers move ready to fruit blocks out of fruiting rooms after first flush. Um, I don't know if the majority do. I'd say a good amount do when they're really trying to push max production. Uh, and it, it really has to do with the size of your, your space. If you have a large fruiting room, um, you might be able to afford leaving them in there longer. One of the things we're gonna do at our farm is do a first flush indoors and then put those blocks outside, just like Willie showed, and allow them to flush um, during the summer months at least outside and get those, those second and third flushes without taking up the valuable you know, real estate in the grow room. So, yeah. I think that's like species too. A lot of yeah. people just do sh shiitake. Uh, most people are just one and done, or yeah. like one and then outside. And oysters, lion's mane, those might, um, you know, leave them in for three or four weeks and get a second flush. Cool. Um, Ken's asking about suggestions about biodegradable bags or reusable fruiting containers. So Unicorn does have a, um, a line of biodegradable bags, and you can read up on their website about sort of the standards for that. There are some, I guess, some questions around what biodegradable means. Um, often those can't be just composted on site. They need like an industrial um, composting facility. Um, some of the literature they put out says, you know, with heat or another treatment, you can potentially biodegrade them on site, but that's a factor. Um, we sourced buckets from a friend of ours who works in a lab um, and so gets buckets every week of full buckets of like isopropyl alcohol <laughs> and the buckets just get thrown out usually. So very clean material to start with. So sometimes you can, you know, find a waste stream that that might have a clean material for you to um, to work with. Any any thoughts on that one, Willie? Um, yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's good. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Kara, so she's asking just to clarify, you get better results with a sawdust straw mix rather than straight straw. No. So I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, when we're working with straw, we generally um, stick to just straw and keep it uh, low nutritive, um, for, you know, because we're usually doing the treatments that are lower um, and lower tech. And so um, supplementing can, can, potentially work, but a lot of times that introduces contamination unless you're doing full sterile techniques or atmospheric steam. Um, usually when you're supplementing, you're, you're using sawdust. And part of that's because you can really mix in these um, grain byproducts and other things much easier. Sawdust is a much, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a much higher surface area. It's, it's much easier to pack, um, you know, and, and mix without having kind of variability. And that's an important thing. So we, we were just doing some of this at Cornell and we found that, you know, those kind of standard size filter patch bags, um, it's almost double the volume when you fill it with straw versus with the sawdust, right? So it's taking up double our shelf space to work with straw bags. And so that's another factor if space is a limitation. Um, so, but generally speaking, yeah, keep the, keep the saw, uh, straw, you know, separate from sawdust um, and kind of pick one way or the other. A couple of questions about keeping blocks refrigerated um, during transport. It really depends on how far you're going and how hot it is outside, right? So um, um, that's just gonna be a factor that you wouldn't wanna have them, you know, heat up too much. Um, so if you're, if you're able to turn them around in a few hours, get them home, that sort of thing, that's fine. But um, that, that could be a consideration uh, if you're going longer distances. Yeah, if, if they're already, if the person you're picking them up from refrigerates them, then yeah, I've, I've driven three, four hours just in the back of a pickup truck and it's mm. well, the blocks are still cold in summer. Um, if you're getting them shipped freight, then you definitely in the summertime need to ship refrigerated freight. Um, in the winter, you're fine to ship any sort of freight, but um, yeah, in the summer, if you're shipping them, definitely get them um, uh, refrigerated. Yeah. Uh, man, yeah, questions galore here. 
do, uh, how about using hardwood pellets? So yeah, hardwood pellets are a very common substrate used um, similar to sawdust. You would still want to clean them, but you could use those in block production recipes and you could supplement those as well. Um, I know, again, Myers Mushrooms, some of his videos talk specifically about hardwood pellets, um, which can be a good option for folks, for sure. Stephanie's asking about hydrated mason's lime. How would you know the magnesium content? Um, that's going to be listed on the package itself. You don't have to test for it. Uh, and so, so you just have to kind of shop around, you know, our local, <clears throat> our local agway, our feed store, the, the, the limestone that they source from is, is the right cons uh, consistency. Um, uh, but I know of other folks who the local source is not, and they might have to, you know, order in a special order or something like that. Um, so it's, it's always listed on the side though. All right. Um, Mark's asking about the kind of how many pounds of lime to a gallon of water. Uh, <clears throat> I think that again depends actually a bit on the um, where your lime's coming from. And I think the best way to go about that is to actually use pH test strips, which can be acquired very cheaply just to make sure you're in the right range. Um, because I don't think there's, there's always a perfect amount. We used about point three, five pounds, I believe, if I look back on our notes um, per gallon for the what stuff we had. So it's usually somewhere between that and, and a half pound per gallon of water. And a um, question about the right mix of coffee and sawdust. You'll have to look at her webinar, but I believe it was about 50-50 was ideal. And she actually added baking soda in as well, which seemed to be important to um, keep out contamination. So if you go, I'll put the web, the webinar link in here um, so folks can watch that if they want. Steve, you want me to answer the rest of these and you can... Uh, yeah. Seven, seven <laughs> yeah, because we'll be here forever. This is great. <laughs> um, <clears throat> do you want to do it verbally or are you thinking in the chat? No, or I'll, just chat I'll just do chat. And okay, then, um, cool. You can... Great. And I'll keep a, I'll keep a note here where I stopped. And so if there's stuff we didn't miss, then, then we'll just kind of circle back as best we can. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have time at the end. <clears throat> totally. All right. So I'm going to talk about Wellspring, our farm and our experience a bit. And then we'll talk about Fat Moon, Mushrooms, just who's been a guest. Whoops. I will mention, um, and I'll turn it over to Willie. I will mention <clears throat> um, that we do have an online course coming up through the Small Farms Program in indoor mushroom cultivation. Uh, and that's a six week class. So we, we continue to talk about these things and dive deeper a bit. Uh, so if that's of interest then um, keep that, um, keep that in mind as a possibility. So our farm, um, we really span the gamut of mushroom production. Um, I love doing the shiitake logs. I love the exercise. I love being outside. Uh, the quality of the shiitake is great. And um, we've been able to really improve our efficiency over time. It's, it's where I started doing research with mushrooms and so I feel very attached to <laughs> continuing that, even though um, <clears throat> it does require a lot of labor. Um, but we do that, plus um, generally do our oysters and chestnuts and, and some lion's mane. And <clears throat> um, my big dream is to do more, more king trumpets, because that's one of my favorite mushrooms indoors. Um, and then we do some wild foraging as well. So we really try to offer our customers a wide range. Some of these things being, you know, oysters and shiitake, generally speaking on our farm, are very consistent throughout the growing season. And then they're peppered in with other things that we grow or, or find in the wild um, as we go. And we started out our indoor, <coughs> excuse me, production um, in just basic high, high tunnel that we stuck in a hedgerow in the woods. It only gets late day sun, hoping that that would provide the proper conditions for us to, um, to get going. Uh, and so <clears throat> basically we prepared this very simply. We put the high tunnel up, the frame up, put gravel down, and then we divided up the space. Um, I think there's a future picture of that. We were doing sawdust inoculation. We had a, a chipper shredder that's still rocking with us, a Mighty Mac, that shredded up that straw. We would treat it in barrels. We've done both heat pasteurization as well as the lime. Um, those tubes in the, in the barrels there was a way for us to mix the lime water and then make sure it evenly distributed so it didn't all get stuck at the top. So pouring into the middle and having holes in those pipes helped kind of um, evenly distribute that moisture. Um, and then we would <clears throat> drain that material and pack it into buckets. And we actually created sort of a, um, 
a, a specific uh, concrete, you know, pounder. Uh, we just poured a form in a sauna tube, put a tool handle in it, and then we had something to, to pound that material down in. So it was very easy to pack the material into these buckets. Um, <clears throat> they worked really well, especially in cooler temperatures, and especially the first few times we used them in this space. You can see right at this point, it was translucent plastic, and so a lot of light in there, a lot of natural light. Essentially, this was a humidity tent that, that created the right conditions for fruiting. Um, we... Uh, we experimented with buckets. We also did some tubes just to, to play with how we could utilize the space and what was most cost efficient. We focused on, you know, timing ourselves and seeing which method was was going to be most cost effective over time for straw. And when we wanted to introduce new strains or species, or you know, when there were lulls in production or issues, we did buy in some blocks here, um, like you can see on the left there. So we did a mix of things. The what I found over time is the ready to fruit blocks can be a nice way to kind of buffer some of the realities of learning to be a, a producer and, 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 and you know, maintain the level of production that your goals are, are striving for. Um, with the straw, what we found in this high tunnel was over time, um, we had two really good years. And then the third year, we just started to have these massive outbreaks of contamination. And, and what's important through that is we had to sort of look back through all the steps in our process and understand where this might be showing up. Um, but we were just getting this persistent contamination. This is trichoderma, one of the common blue-green molds. It's kind of the, the nemesis of anyone who's doing this outdoor cultivation. And as I did more research, you learn that trichoderma responds very well to fluctuations in temperature and fluctuations in light and thrives in a high, a warm environment with, um, with, uh, with ample um, light. And so this was the condition we were creating with this high tunnel, uh, whether we liked it or not. So one of the things that happens is trichoderma is native in the soil. It's going to show up in the soil. So we tried to, um, you know, uh, cover up that ground and gravel is not a good medium on the floor. It's not something that we can clean. So we were putting down landscape fabric. We were trying um, plastic, all sorts of things to try to uh, eliminate that as an issue. Um, but it still proved to be a bit challenging. The other thing was that because the high tunnel space was not insulated, cooling it, in the hottest months, even though it was only getting late day sun, um, proved to be very expensive. Uh, so we had this, you know, little air conditioning unit. You can kind of see in the corner there, the gray, and it was just pumping out uh, air, cold air all day and it wasn't able really to keep up. So we would have these, these massive fluctuations. And I think that's a key learning is, is to keep our temperature fluctuations in check. And it wasn't something that this space was uh, affording us. And we started to put, um, you know, reflective tarps on the top and try to reduce it. but it was really hard to do in this space. So um, in that interim time, when we, when we kind of said, all right, this isn't working, we need to step back from this. Um, we did use ready to fruit blocks as a way to, to bridge this with our customers and, and bring new varieties in. So chestnut was something we actually just last year started trying. And rather than get into the inoculation process, we just bought in blocks to see if our customers even wanted them. We'd gotten them used to shiitake and oyster, weren't sure if they wanted the chestnuts. And so the ready fruit blocks were a great way to try that out and see see what they thought and people are pretty excited about it and so we had a, a critical point in our um, farm which was do we want to keep um, you know stringing this along and kind of making it work or do we want to do ready to fruit blocks because the high tunnel actually is a phenomenal space for ready to fruit blocks all we really needed was to keep the light damped down a bit keep the humidity up and we found that the temperatures were acceptable enough for fruiting. It was just in this incubation phase where we were getting this, you know, contamination problem. So if we were willing to stick with ready to fruit blocks only, we could have continued to use the high tunnel, but lots of shifting on our farm and the high tunnel actually became more valuable um, for other things. <laughs> and so we decided to put our effort and investment into a, 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 a proper mushroom house. So uh, a slab floor with drains, a steel frame, and we're in the process of finishing this up um, over the winter for next season, where we're actually um, doing uh, layers of insulation on the outside. We're going to have spray foam on the inside, so it's going to be a very insulated building. Um, the cost to heat and cool this is going to allow us to economically keep our temperature ranges very stable and also work during that cold off season that we have in upstate New York. And this building is going to be around a ten or twelve thousand dollar investment, um, which is pretty good for. For the size, it's about 16 by 20, and, and we'll expect to, to do really well with production, and this will continue to be in tandem with our with our outdoor logs and things like that. We kind of do that hybrid um, 
production system, I'll just share a couple notes about Fat Moon Mushrooms, which is located in Massachusetts. This is an operation that's chosen to focus solely on using ready-to-fruit blocks and, and scaling at a, at a rate that allows them to do that economically. So uh, 2,500 square foot uh, space, aiming to produce um, 500 pounds or more a week, and really focused on, and what's great about Elizabeth, and she's a guest in our course, is she keeps really good notes and knows exactly the types of decisions she needs to make in order to make this work um, profitable. So the trailer, the cool bot I showed you before was from her, her setup. Um, she has a couple of grow rooms, 18 by 24, just a little bit bigger, maybe a third bigger than what Willie was showing before. They're buying in blocks, they're storing them in, then they're introducing them every single week. And similar kind of stuff, this low tech, simple ways to um, introduce humidity, uh, do air exchange, all that kind of stuff um, in, these, in these grow rooms, which are basically framed out with two by fours and plastic, and then these simple shelving units as a way to produce. And one of the things that she's emphasized that she's shared with the class over the years is, so you really can see the scaling of this and how it makes sense. I mentioned before, you're kind of um, working within the cost that the provider is able to give you in terms of the, the blocks themselves. So she can make those efficiency changes on all the other aspects of the business. And for just a ready to fruit um, mushroom farm with the blocks, I think there's a certain larger scale that might be required for the long-term piece. So for her, she was finding that um, at the sort of $60,000 gross revenue level, there wasn't anything left over for profit. She needed to look at these larger um, <clears throat> avenues as a way to really uh, start to see profitability in her business. And I think, uh, again, the sort of record keeping, uh, she keeps every record of every you know uh, pound per block. She wants to make sure that if she's buying these blocks in, that, that she's getting the yields that she would expect. And she's constantly in dialogue with the supplier to make sure that she's getting the highest quality material in for the business. Over to you, Willie. Yeah, so this is the um, room that I was talking about earlier and we kind of saw it. So this is what we started out in and we're buying blocks in. Um, and then our next iteration, um, or I guess this was an addition, um, second grow room was in a tobacco barn. So it was really similar setup. The tobacco barn had concrete on it. This was a three season grow room. Um, and basically it was just, you know, we were at max capacity in that smaller room. So we added this one in, um, really simple, um, fan on one end and, uh, yeah, basic. Uh, so that was an easy one, and in, in, in both of those, we didn't control temperature. Um, so we were just buying blocks in and got up to about 250, 300 pounds per week, and that's when we decided to move into a warehouse. Um, and when we moved to the warehouse, we um, uh, started uh, making our own supplemented sawdust bags. So we used a sauna steamer that would um, pump steam into these cattle troughs. These are insulated cattle troughs, uh, 300 gallon insulated cattle troughs. They could fit um, 200 bags each. And um, you can see the one that's um, on the right side of the picture is kind of out. It has the top on and the steam's being pumped into, um, into the bag. And, we turn the steamer on and it would go for 24 hours and then we turn it off. So uh, it was about eight hours to get up to temperature and then 16 hours at temperature. Um, those would be rolled into our lab um, and unloaded in the lab. And um, you can see here's, here's uh, our first version of a flow hood. We had got it from a, a you know, science surplus place. Um, and so, we would, there was also where all these bags are um, stacked up on the right, there is a intake flow hood. So a flow hood right on that table, um, just keeping the, the whole lab positive pressured and um, clean. Um, and then we would do inoculations on the left side uh, in, that, in that flow hood. So sometimes the lab got super full of bags like this day, um, but it, it worked and we got up, we were doing um, three or four, uh, uh, rounds of um, inoculation, so producing anywhere from, 
you know, 600 to 800. And sometimes we do a fifth one. So you have a thousand bags uh, being produced a week um, in the new uh, uh, warehouse. Um, after two years of that, uh, we added on some trailers. Uh, so this is turning, uh, we had two trailers for fruiting and two trailers for uh, in incubation. So the, um, uh, this is just turning those trailers into uh, putting all those shelving in. So on the left is the outside. We, the, the place we moved into had, I think, eight loading docks on it. Um, and so we, we backed up uh five yeah we, we put in five uh trailers one of them was a walk-in cooler um to really just expand out our um our, our space um and you can see on the on the right this is the fruiting on the top is the ventilation um as, as well as the humidifier um so those little dangling down are the misters and then um we could fit oh man we could fit a lot of blocks in here you know, maybe five or 600 um, total. So yeah, it was tons. And our first, the first, um, we, we were selling ready to fruit blocks as well as uh, grow kits and Fat Moon Mushrooms was actually the first uh, customer that we sold our, our ready to fruit blocks to. So um, kind of been, and Elizabeth was a person who, you know, I was doing this stuff outdoors in the uh, low tunnels and Elizabeth really took it to a next level and was was basically just at the beginning just doing that um, for her production and has has moved up since then into indoor production and um, more year-round production um, this is a farm uh, out in Truro Mass um, I was really impressed because someone kind of just really um, put this together with minimal infrastructure I mean probably maybe a thousand dollars of infrastructure total um, this is at the end of a of a um, hoop house um, it's it's a uh, not super clean place you know it's like dirt floor and um, not crazy clean and then the white plastic that you see is the uh, space that was made into a lab um, the they just converted a 55 gallon metal drum um, and our pumping, there's a heating element inside of there and our, uh, there's a water line that feeds it. So um, they're generating their own steam. Um, and same, same scenario where it's kind of turn it on, leave it on for 24 hours and then uh, roll it into the lab. Um, and the lab is a pretty simple two by two uh, flow hood uh, filter. Um, you know, the lab in total is probably six by six. It's a really small, um, uh, pretty small operation. Yeah, Kathleen, this is Uli's um, operation. Um, and I still haven't gotten a name from him of what his, his uh, farm's called. Um, he's using 10 pound bags and um, uh yeah then cement cement mixer underneath to shake the bags up and then the bags go into incubation usually for about two weeks um and then into the fruiting room and the fruiting room is kind of this uh, converted uh cabin space um that was uh on the farm um and uh yep and um yeah, just one window with uh, exhaust and the inside is some PVC shelving uh, with the, the mushrooms uh, laying right on them. So these are uh, 10 pound blocks and just fruiting lion's mane and oysters, which I think is really smart when you start producing your own blocks because both, both of those are pretty aggressive species. So even if you don't do everything perfect or if you have a little bit of contamination, um, they can kind of overcome it. Um, so beautiful clusters of, of blue oyster and this person was buying, um, Uli was buying in uh, spawn from I think North Spore, maybe Field and Forest, maybe both. Um, so yeah, great, great options and a pretty, um, you know, easy setup to, not easy setup to get going, but very replicable. and. 
Um, he at the same time was working on a vegetable farm and, you know, this wasn't his full-time operation. So, um, and it was growing somewhere around, you know, hundred to 120 pounds, uh, a week. Um, so awesome, uh, uh, option. All right, great. <clears throat> Thanks. So we're going to just pop over. Let me give me a second here to switch. Oops. That is not what I wanted. Hold on. There's a, there was like some questions about um, hair nets and gloves in inoculation. And I, I actually don't really like using gloves in the lab. Um, I prefer just bare hands. Um, sometimes some people do, but I, I find it fine. And um, yeah, hair nets can be nice. And again, if you're like really mindful, what I what I found is that if I'm really mindful in the lab, then um, I don't need very much in there. Um, it's not going to make a big impact on the um, uh, contamination rates. But if if there's like new folks in there, if if I'm like not being mindful or not being very clean, then that's when I'm like, okay, I really need to get some. Um, uh, get any gloves and I need you know like when we started having three people in the lab then we did wear gloves so okay cool well, we can keep putting questions in the chat and we'll hang out for a bit and answer as many as we can handle but I just want to turn us to our um, homework for those that are going to apply and for everyone else this is uh, hopefully a useful tool as you start to think about and model different scenarios um, this is very much something that we are in the beta version of but I've been working with a spreadsheet wizard to to help do this and um, and if you're going to apply to be in the in the long-term program we're going to ask that uh, we get a copy of this so what's key to understand is that if you go to the link it's not something you can edit right away you need to make a copy of it you go to file um, file make a copy and you can make your own copy or you can go to download and download um, an excel version if you want to use it on your desktop there's a couple sheets in here this one just describes um, some of the, uh, uh, the important things to know so you can read through that and then we have two pay, uh, sheets on here the first is what we're going to ask for folks to work through especially if you're going to apply for the program but it's a good list of um, kind of working through the different decision making points and starting to put some numbers down and, and you know before we get into budgeting and something deeper this is a good way to kind of start to think about some of the questions you'll need to answer if you're going to continue to grow so as you work down here you're going to fill out um, some of the all in the green column here you're going to put your answers or numbers there's some description descriptions or notes on the right side for you to uh, to, um, to to consider as you go and at the end here we'll be able to actually look at some some totals as we start to work through this so this is really something for you to play with um, we'd love feedback if um, something you find that's confusing or think could be changed that's always great because this is again a new a new tool that we're just working and wanting to share but also knowing it's it's imperfect so that's just to fill out and kind of play with and um, the thing I want to share then the next sheet is is a projection um, calculator that I've been working on with this, this spreadsheet fella so if you change numbers in yellow we have a couple kind of parameters for you to set um, you can put your, this is just for the fruiting room, by the way, this is not uh, including your incubation space, but this is just assuming uh, you have, whether you buy in ready to fruit blocks or you make them, um, this is going to project some of your weekly um, production numbers, depending on the season and the parameters that you set. And if you're doing straw inoculation, what you can do is just look at your yields um, and cut those in half because then it'll give you a sense on straw because as we mentioned, it's going to produce a little bit. So you just kind of work through this, uh, setting your, the parameters for your fruiting room size, the growing season, you can choose what months you want to start and end, okay? Uh, residency would be if you're going to leave the blocks in for one, two, or three flushes. So one week, four weeks, or eight weeks is roughly getting you to those one, two, or three, although it's going to depend a bit on the species. This was originally modeled after oyster production, um, which shiitake, as Willie mentioned, is going to be a bit longer. Um, you can leave these other in the middle column here, the arid usage and packing efficiency is really about how much of the space you're using. 
but you can just leave those if you want. Um, we, we have some assumptions around the cost of blocks, which you could change if you know, or you can leave, and then your revenue. And, um, and then over here on the right, there are some assumptions, some things at this point you can't actually change. Uh, and so we're assuming that the first flush is going to give you about a pound, the second one a half a pound, third one a quarter of a pound. And then we're assuming that this is going to be your cost in terms of labor, how many minutes per block for doing these different tasks. So if you change the yellow things to fit your um, situation as much as possible, then what's cool is this will generate this wonderful uh, calendar that'll show you each week how many blocks you might put in and remove, what kind of flushes you might expect, what kind of cumulative yields and labor hours, um, cost of blocks, transportation storage, labor, sales revenue, all that stuff. And you can kind of look at the cumulative and weekly revenue that you might expect. Now this is all gross revenue, just to give you a sense. There's a lot of variables in here. This is not a full budget, but it is a way to project and get a sense. And one of the key things is that, you know, if you start out, you're gonna uh, kind of amp up to your, your max production um, you know, over several weeks and things like that. And so that's gonna all change. And so this is a way that you can try one scenario and then you can go up here and we'll say, actually, instead of April to November, I'm gonna produce starting in March and see what that looks like or start later in the season. And I can change the parameters of my size if I, if I haven't built something yet, or I don't have something in mind, right? So you can just start to play with these things and get a sense of how that um, computes out different, different uh, results, all right? So if you're, uh, you know, this is your homework in a sense, if you're gonna apply for us, we want you to kind of play with these tools and fill out the responses in this green. And so hopefully the, the sheet I just showed you will help in aiding you in some of the responses on this, on this middle piece here. But you know, really just starting at the top and kind of walking through this is gonna help you understand also just the myriad of decisions that play into getting a, a specialty mushroom operation on the ground and up and rolling. All right, so I did put the link in the chat. We'll post it right to the um, Fungi Ally website as well. And um, yeah, with that, we are a little over eight o'clock here. Uh, thanks everybody for listening. And um, I'm happy to hang out for a few more minutes before I have to run. I don't know where Willie's at, but we can see if there's a couple more questions. There's always gonna be more questions, but we can answer a few. And uh, we will see you all next week for webinar three.